Hello there, my fellow ancient wanderers, and welcome back to another lore video from the wonderful universe of Dune. Last time, we got started on the story of the so-called Zensuni Wanderers or Nomads. I also promised I would finish their journey, so here I am today. I know these videos only get like 300 views, but nevertheless I wanted to finish this story both for the sake of completion and also because I think it's an interesting and enjoyable story. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us see where these people went next, shall we? After being forcefully evicted from their second home on Poritrin, about five million Zensuni were taken to Salusa Secundus which was the homeworld of House Corino, which had been made the Imperial prison planet by this point, after the Corinos shifted their capital to Keitain. The prison planet had an ecological system so harsh that 6 out of 13 people born there died before the age of 11. It was made even worse for them by the fact that the Lanzra troops had recognized their unshakable sense of loyalty and community, even in conditions of extreme peril. Considering that, they were held as slaves and made to perform in the most difficult and dangerous tasks in order to break their spirit. That plan, fortunately for the Zensuni, didn't really work. While hundreds of thousands of them died in the first decade, the majority of them appear to have reverted to the ways of their ancestors. At the end of their first generation as slaves, ironically, they were exhibiting a higher survival rate than the natives of Salusa Secundus themselves. Subjected to even more rigorous oppression, the third generation would prove even more resilient than the first two. The fifth generation was commanded to give up on their faith or die, and although all the known Sayadina and over half the population were butchered, their doctrine continued to be passed on under carefully disguised work chants and new Sayadina that were initiated. In the generations 7 and 8, attempts were made to convert all the able-bodied Zensuni to the mystic disciplines of the Sardukar. The end result was always the same though. The Zensuni either ignored the attempt or feigned going along with the conversion until the instructors could no longer keep them away from weapon training. And at that point, the convert arranged to kill as many students and instructors as possible, before killing himself. In 5295, Emperor Ezar VII reviewed the records detailing nine generations of his own ancestors' failures with the Zensuni, and decided he was not gonna be responsible for number 10. Taking full advantage of the chance to be remembered for generosity, the Emperor announced it was no longer his policy to punish people, the only crime of whom was to have had criminal ancestors. He thus arranged for the survivors of the Zensuni to be transferred to the world of Ishia. Meanwhile, the other group of Zensuni who were not taken to Salusa Secundus were instead taken to the world of Bella Tegois. And if I'm mispronouncing that, please correct me. Aside from the initial wrench of having lost half their number after leaving Poritren, the Zensuni who were transported in 4492 to Bella Tegois were treated and fared a lot better. Upon landing, they were given the stock and machinery that they would need and then left alone. When years had passed with no sign of the raiders' return, the Zensuni once again adopted many of the customs acquired on Poritren. They established their homes, and then their farms, and then their grazing areas, but with differences as well. On Poritren, where they had been so certain that no one and nothing was gonna disturb them again, at least until the time of the journey to Nilotical Uruba, they had scattered their settlements all across the planet. On Belategois, on the other hand, the settlements were bigger, closer together, and more in contact with one another. They were also heavily walled, and sentries were posted every day and night. It was not all grim and dark, however. There was time, as there had been on Poritren, to study the Shah Nama, the first book. There was time to raise trees and flowering plants, 
to build fountains and monuments, to wander about and pray for the other half of their number that they never expected to see again. And there was time as well, many centuries of peace. Unfortunately, when the Sardukar came again in 6049, none of that mattered one bit. These and Sunni would fight the invaders, and many of them died valiantly. But by the end of a pitifully brief battle, there were two groups of Zensuni left on Bela Tegois. Those who submitted, and were now being prepared to be transported on the worlds of Rosak and Harmontep, and those that resisted and died. The segment of the Bela Tegois Zensuni who were sent to Rosak found a much less friendly planet than Bela Tegois itself. Rosak was a cold and blustery world the fifth planet of a star called Alces Minor, which appeared to take much of its own heat and keep it only to itself. The growing season here was very short, and many of the plants that did grow here were, to a greater or lesser degree, poisonous. The colonists that were already there and were not Zensuni were barely scratching out an existence as it was, and they had no time for newcomers. This, of course, was good for the Zensuni, who had had more contact with outsiders than they would ever care for. The settlement of the Zensuni barely survived the first winter. They were not a very big group to begin with. In addition to the illnesses, they were faced with near starvation and a wide variety of poisonings. It was because of one of these poisonings that the Zensuni actually made their next great leap in religion. One of the Sayadina, desperate with hunger, would eat a portion of a native plant which was not exactly safe. As the Sayadina would put it later, she suddenly found herself within the minds of all the Sayadina who had come before. This unknown Sayadina was the Zensuni's first reverend mother. Their entire philosophy would be immediately altered. Rather than merely attempt to follow the ways of the ancestors, it was now possible for the tribes to know what those ways were by listening to a reverend mother's observations of the past. When it was also discovered that the memories of one reverend mother could be passed on to another reverend mother by the means of the poison, the Zensuni were finally certain that their history could now be accurately passed on from one another. As soon as their survival on Rosak appeared reasonably secure, the Zensuni began to plan for their survival elsewhere. Because why wait until the Sardukar came again and killed half of you, and then move you somewhere else, when you could go somewhere else yourself? And towards that goal, with great misgivings, the Zensuni made their first cautious approaches to their neighbors on Rosak. Young Zensuni men and women were hired out to work on the farms of their neighbors who were not doing as well as their own. The old women used their medical skills to heal the sick and the dying outside their own settlement. It was not an easy job, nor was it quick. But in 7193, they were ready. The leaders of the settlement would have to decide where those who would be leaving would go. Now there was a type of rejoicing among the Zensuni, which had not been there for generations. There was sorrow as well though. This time, it would be the Zensuni themselves who were dividing their people, for they had only accumulated enough to buy passage for the young people. The rates of the guild were notoriously expensive. At the end, it was a guildsman who provided the Zensuni with their choice of destination. A representative of theirs with whom the Zensuni leaders had been negotiating revealed to them the location of the descendants of the Lost Ones, which was how these and Sunni called the ancestors that were taken to Salusa Secundus. Thus, a bargain was struck. Before the young men and women left the settlement and board the ship of the guildsmen, a Sayadina among their number was admitted to the Reverend Mother Rite, and entrusted with a supply of the plants which produced the special poison. Their memories thus safely passed on, the old and Sunni watched their sons and daughters walk away knowing that sadly they would never see them again. And knowing too that their odds of surviving another winter on Rosak without them were next to negligible. Of the lives of the Zensuni transported to Harmontep, 
unfortunately nothing is known. On their way to Ischia, the refugees of Rosak were given a comprehensive explanation of what had happened to the segment of their people who had been out of reach for so long. What the guildsmen did describe at great length was the planet to which those survivors had been sent. Ischia, they explained, was the opposite of Rosak. It was arid and hot. Those few crops which survived did so only because of tremendous amounts of time and energy spent in careful irrigation. The system had to be constantly washed as well, as a single day's deprivation could kill an entire field. The Zetsuni Onishia had come from a tougher environment even than that, but even so, adapting was difficult. They were not accustomed to the workings of the desert, and becoming accustomed cost them dearly in the beginning. By reverting to many of the ways of the ancestors from the time of the nomadic tribes, the Isha Zensuni would eventually learn to live with the desert instead of fighting against it. And then they thrived where once it was believed that the colony would barely be able to survive. The Zensuni of Rosak listened gravely, but they were not frightened. What one segment of their people could do, surely another could as well. One of their number even, on being told that this group might have even more difficulty than they expected, was bold enough to voice that belief. The guildsman replied, Ah, but you don't understand me yet. You are not going to Ischia, but to the world for which Ischia was your people's training ground. This one is a world called Arrakis. And so, in 7193, all the known Zensuni in the Imperium were taken to Arrakis. This final relocation, organized in secret by the Spacing Guild, would serve the purposes of both sides involved. It gave the Zensuni a new home, and maybe the only world in the Imperium where they would be too difficult to dig out for the Emperor and the Sardukar for them to even bother trying and it gave the Spacing Guild a permanent contact on Arrakis. The guildsmen wanted such an arrangement because of the Spice Melange, found only in the Arrakis Desert. This was similar but infinitely more powerful and subtle than the poison that the Zensuni had discovered on Rosak, Melange being essential to the guild's interstellar monopoly as well. It was in the best interest of the guild to control a large supply of Melange via a grateful native population. The guildsmen made certain that the Zensuni were established deep in the desert to ensure their own safety from the settlers already on Arrakis. The Zensuni recognized that they were now no longer just a religious sect, but an entire people. And from that day onward, they would call themselves not Zensuni, but the Fremen. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the journey and the ending of the journey for the Zensuni nomads, ancestors of the much more well-known Fremen. And with this, hopefully you learned where the Fremen came from, even before they were known as Fremen. To be honest, I thought it was a very enjoyable story, and I hope you liked it as well. If you have your own thoughts about it, or questions, do share them in the comments below. If you want to see more Dune videos, please try to support the series by watching to the end, liking, sharing, and commenting. You can also click the bell notification icon to stay more up to date. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you all a great and healthy day. May the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.